Hey everyone, I am here today with Lena. Oops, it's Lana. <laughs> I already <laughs> messed it up. We're gonna start that again. <laughs> Look at me. <laughs> right. That happens. Hey everyone, I am here today with Lana Schlafer, who is a mindset coach, a law of attraction expert, and author of the best-selling book, Manifest That Miracle. Learn why you don't have what you want and how to get it. Yay. Over the past decade, she has empowered thousands to manifest what seems out of reach, including crossing seven figures in business, healing from chronic illnesses, and meeting ideal partners. She has an energetic personality and no holds barred coaching that's been featured in media outlets such as Forbes and NPR. She studied at UC Berkeley and the Institute of Transpersonal Psychology. She lives in warm, sunny Puerto Rico, and I am insanely jealous right now. And uh, she has an amazing husband and three kids and can be found dancing around her house and hosting uh, the celebrations of the smallest moments in life. So welcome, Lana. Thank you for having me. I hope we have a celebration party at the end of this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So, I mean, I guess let's just start with, I love this topic. And before we hopped on, I, I had said to you, like how excited I am because I love all things manifestation, law of attraction. I live it. I believe it. I read it. I study it like all the things. So what made you get into this work? I feel like for a lot of people, it comes from a spiritual or religious background. And I grew up in communist Russia and was atheist. So I did not have anything resembling new age in my childhood. And when I came to the U.S. when I was 12, I really worked hard to like fulfill the immigrants dream that like my parents wanted for their kids. And so I went to great college. I had like five job offers out of college. I worked in investment banking and I felt like I had achieved the goals that I thought would make me happy or less miserable than I had been for many years. And it only drove me deeper into depression. And the truth is there was a lot of unresolved issues that I had from not just being picked up from everything I knew and moving here, but just, I had a tough childhood. I think everybody who grew up in a environment like I did, and it all started catching up to me and creating real problems. And I felt like I, had the wherewithal that this is not what like my ancestors died for in the war. This is not why my parents came to this country for me to now have enough money in my bank and be more miserable than they had ever been. And that was a real challenge for me to like sort of let go of the illusion of this American dream or this perfect relationship or this perfect anything. And the best decision I made was to say, look, I don't know what it is, but it's not this. And I remember giving my resignation in investment banking being like, I'm either smarter than y'all or I'm crazier than everybody here. So I'm like, I don't know which one it is, but I'm going to find out. And so I went on this journey and it started off with just meditation and yoga, which I had started practicing in college. And it was like the few moments of peace that I was able to create for the first time ever in my life. And I had like eating disorders and all kinds of issues that prevented me from really moving into my body. But I started therapy. I, I did a lot of healing things, but it wasn't until I did a yoga teacher training in Mexico that somebody handed me some CDs from Abraham Hicks and the law of attraction that things really made sense. And somebody gave me the movie, The Secret. And I was like, ah, that's a bunch of BS. I don't believe in it. But I ended up going to um, Agape Spiritual Center in LA um, Michael Beckwith, who's in the movie, The Secret, was one of the speakers. And I have to say, I walked in there and all of these moments, there was something I received that was bigger than my conditioning, bigger than like my skepticism. I feel like I walked the line between skepticism and cynicism, but thank God I was open enough because the truth is the more I tried the tiny shifts that sort of entered somewhere in my mind, like, okay, let's try this gratitude thing. It probably doesn't work, but you know, let's try it the more results I saw. And then it became like addictive. Well, what else is possible? Like, I, I was never taught this. What do you mean if I just physically like connect for five minutes a day, what I'm grateful for, my whole life will change? Are you kidding me? Why isn't this on every billboard and every conversation? Like my mind was so blown. So I really haven't stopped since. And I've done so many things, you know, to 
sharpen my skill set, and to go beyond, I would say, the typical mindset and law of attraction. I did go to Institute of Transpersonal Psychology and was on my way to become a marriage and family therapist. So I kind of figured I never actually want to do that as my career, but that training and being able to understand trauma and how to create a healing container and all of that. Now I blend it all together to what I would like to think is a much more grounded approach to mindset healing and deliberately creating, like we are far more powerful than we realize. That's my entire assumption. And when I work with clients, they prove it to themselves. Oh, I love that. I say, all the time to my family, my husband, my kids, there's no reason for you to ever have a bad day. You have the power to have an unbelievable day every single day. And yeah. so I, I want it for the newbies of law of attraction who are thinking like, whatever, rolling their eyes, not me. Like, can you give us a crash course on what it means to you and, and what it looks like? Yeah. So the, the multi-layered question, the one that I frequently have a hard time answering because it is like saying, describe music to us. I'm like, well, that's a very personal thing. Like some people, even deaf people, for example, who can't hear music can still feel the vibration. They can still receive something. So I describe it differently to a deaf person versus somebody who spent the last you know, 15 years studying the piano, right? But the idea is, that you are not just a collection of your behaviors and your experiences and what you have sort of been able to measure and see in your life. That there is a mechanism in your mind, um, and I would even say in your body, there is an intelligence or there is a, a patterning system. There is some way of collecting and assembling information that results in how you show up in the world. And when you can do so deliberately, you will change what things occur in your life. And not just what things occur, but how you feel about anything that occurs and the things that show up. It's almost like if you, you know, like I was in Russia, we did not have, you know, back when it was communist, any kind of commerce. We did not have all of the bubble gum and the candy. We had like the two candies that the communist government decided to make. I didn't even have the sense of possibility that there's something more than this. We had two flavors of ice cream, vanilla and chocolate. There was no, I remember for the first time walking into like 31 flavor or something. I was like, what? There are more flavors? What do you mean? But it's, it's a part of what we subconsciously create in our lives. Our beliefs and experiences uh, create an environment where we only see certain things. So we only see the two flavors or the five flavors. We can't even see the other flavors, much less do something. If we can't see them, we can't utilize those opportunities. We can't taste it, right? So I feel like ultimately, and I, and I, Talk about law of attraction always with a smile and kind of a smirk because you do not need to believe in it. This is not a religion. I'm not asking you to have faith or even believing in me and what I'm saying. My entire premise for my book is go and test this for yourself and see what happens. And typically when people ask me, what is law of attraction? I say, instead of me telling you what it is, why don't I tell you what it can do? Let's try it. And then you see for yourself. And there's a very simple exercise that you can do. If you just take your sort of current state from one to 10, one being you're the most miserable you've ever been, 10 is the happiest you've ever been. So you just check in with yourself, you connect with your breath, your body, whatever it is. And you might say, okay, I'm a six. You know, I'm not ecstatic, off the wall, happy, but I'm not miserable. So what, where are you at right now? Oh, I'm, I'm hovering right around a nine. I'd be okay, so right in some place warm and sunny. <laughs> okay, so perfect. It's actually perfect. So you're at a nine. I would say I'm, I don't know, let's pick an eight or something, right? So two things that you could do to show yourself that you can instantly change your state and that you have the power to do so. And then watching the rest of your day and what happens would be the second part of the experiment, which we won't do today. One way would be to think of something really miserable of the worst experience you've ever had and really take yourself down. That is very possible. Everyone's done it at some point. Something triggered your memory. You're like, oh my God, I remember how bad it was and off and off you went. And then your whole day kind of got tainted and that sort of level dropped and uh, impacted what happened to you and how you felt. What we're gonna do today is you're going to imagine that you are on the most beautiful beach paradise. 
right? You're here. I'm, you, you've come to visit. I've taken you to the island Culebra, which has one of the top 10 most beautiful beaches in the world. I mean, it is like powder white sand. You step in it and it just like warms your entire body. You look at the ocean and the way that it reflects with the sun rays. And you just feel like the most expansive, the, like the queen of the world, where how can this possibly get better? You can add anything you want to this vision. You could have a tropical drink in your hand. You can be, you know, being embraced by the hottest man you can imagine. You can, you can add anything you want to this vision. And if you stay in it for just a little while, you're like, oh, this feels so good. I feel so good. And you start to notice how it actually impacts how you feel, not just what you see. So how does it make you feel when you're there? Feels, makes me feel warm and toasty. Right, and your body yeah. starts moving. You're like, yeah. And I bet it's starting to take you from a nine to like a nine and a half already, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you do this consistently, and we did it for three seconds, but imagine if you did this, and I give a bazillion exercises because some people are visual, some people need to write, some people need to speak. There's all these modes of essentially entering this reality. What happens through the rest of the day, if you practice this consistently, is you start making a bridge to it. All of a sudden, you're starting to notice, uh, you know, commercials for a tropical beach or something. You're like, oh, you're noticing, you're having conversation. Your husband's like, hey, our friends went to Aruba and they had a great time and they have a timeshare. And you're like, oh, would they want to let us use it? All of a sudden, you start, and this is quite literal what we're saying about actually being on a beach, but the greatest manifestations, the impact of this, is that you can bring some of that energy to your work. You show up at your desk and you take a moment to pause and to breathe in and to be like, I, I looked up your bio, you've built an incredible company. I mean, you're a badass woman. Mm -hmm. Like, do you spend the 30 seconds this morning being like, I did this. This was a vision. This was a pipe dream. And now it's reality. And there are real people out there doing real things that will start to impact your life at a scale that is exponential. Like it's like compound interest, that it starts building, building, building. So Lana, what about someone who is going through the worst time in their life? And usually that looks like a divorce and they're saying my ex is an asshole. Like he is making me miserable. I can't think my way out of this. I can't feel yeah. good to get out of this. Like how yeah. does someone move beyond that, that place? you have to move through it. And so I take the idea of your emotions and put it on a keyboard. So you have the lower notes, which would be powerlessness, anger, depression, sadness, disappointment. And you have, you know, the neutral notes like boredom or like hopefulness. And then you move into like ecstasy and love and freedom. And if you only want to play the higher notes of the scales, only the higher octave, you end up creating maybe an okay song. Nah, 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 nah. This is where you sound. But if you want to really create a masterpiece, you have to learn how to play all the notes masterfully. And so one of the things that I remind people is that what you now think is your lowest moment will be part of your masterpiece. And in order to really create the masterpiece, you're going to have to play these notes and play them well. And what that means typically when you are at that low moment, those are the breaking down and the breaking open moments. So it will take you to your edge because you are ready to go beyond what you've lived. It's not comfortable. I don't know why people expect it to be comfortable. I don't know why we're not saying, oh, good, that's expected. You're, you're going to feel like crap because everything in your world fell apart because you are creating a new world. Our, our language and our relationships, especially in American culture, don't really allow for acknowledgement and empathy and compassion for where someone is. But also like when my you know now four-year-old was learning to walk, I didn't cry every time he fell down thinking he's never gonna walk again. Oh my God, he's never gonna get it. I knew that this is a part of the journey. Even if he fell down and scraped himself, I'd comfort him. I'd show up where he is. And I'd also know that this is a part of his journey of becoming 
the next version of himself and growing up. And I think something happens that we grow as adults and we don't change clothes sizes, our feet don't grow, and we forget that we are always changing and evolving. I wish there were more ages, you know, and stages that we have beyond like being a teenager and then adult is somehow for the next like 80 years. I mean, so many of us aren't recognizing that we've outgrown what wasn't working. And one of the key things about those really, really low notes is if you can allow yourself to break you open at that time and support is key. Support is key at any level, but support is especially key. And usually it is easier for people who already have support or who are willing to receive it. And it is the hardest for people like me, whose first words were myself. And I did not want to let anyone support me, which is why I struggle so much. And looking back, I see that the biggest part of the struggle is that I couldn't let support in. So if you're listening to this and you are in massive pain, I guarantee you that the answer is going to be support. Now, in what form? Well, it comes in a lot of forms. Maybe it's hiring a therapist, coach, you know, doing some mind mindset work. Maybe it's getting childcare. Maybe it's allowing your family to support you. Maybe, I don't know, telling your girlfriend about things that you haven't admitted because you need to really feel supported in an emotional way, whatever it is. But the like biggest sort of understanding that changed my life forever was that no place is bad. Every place is a place of creation. So I stopped beating myself up because I was quote unquote unhappy for a moment or for a day. I mean, if something awful happens, we lost two family members to COVID last year. We should be sad and grieving. That is an appropriate and necessary response. Now, because I've known how to play those notes, I spend that time grieving and almost side by side, there is more impetus for life that shows up for me, that the time to do the things that I want to do is now. It is more real. It is more acute. It is more powerful. They have it on my husband's side. So that really woke him up. And so there is sorrow and, and joy side by side or, or meaning in the pain that takes us into massive gain eventually. This is wisdom. I think over time, we develop the wisdom to know what we need and the perspective right? But again, our culture just does a terrible job. We don't really honor elders who know all this information. I wish, I don't think there'd be a need for coaches and therapists like me. If you just had a bunch of elders like we used to, and you could actually have counsel and support. How long does it take someone to really embrace, adopt, live, and learn everything that you're talking about? I mean, is this something that someone can really have almost an immediate gratification or is it a process? They need to do it for years before they see a result. If you don't have immediate gratification, you're doing it wrong. So immediate gratification, but there's, there's a caveat, right? That the immediate gratification will be internal. And the reason that most people don't think that's immediate gratification is because they value so little feeling good. They are so accustomed to a level of pain and suffering that feeling good is they feel guilty about it. Maybe they have beliefs around, well, I can't be better than my husband, mother, sister, brother is so upset. I can't be the you know, tallest poppy syndrome, or they are worried about, you know, the other shoe will drop or like all these belief systems. But the bottom line is they don't value feeling better or feeling good. They just want the outer result. And then if you drill deep and I'm like, well, why do you want that outer result? Why do you want this? Why do you want all, oh, because this will happen. This will happen. Why do you want that? Why do you want that? And ultimately it's like, there's no other answer other than I will feel better. That is the bottom line. So what I'm suggesting is be intelligent about it and really move to the feeling better. And what starts to happen when you actually value how you feel a little bit more, like the, the whole point is that it's a never ending thing. It's almost like, well, how long will you need to brush your teeth to have good dental hygiene? Well, probably a couple of times a day and you might want to go to get dental checkups. And if you have a cavity, you actually need a professional to go and fill that cavity. If you have a root canal, you're not going to have a root canal every day for the rest of your life. But if that is coming up, when you tend to it, that's how long it's going to take, right? But so if you look at it as something that you create as a part of your life enhancement as a part of living a fulfilled, meaningful, joyful, purposeful life, then the question of how long does it apply? It's more like, how good can I feel today? What can I create that has meaning today? 
what can I learn from this book or from this person or from this program? Ooh, that's good. That feels better. I'm noticing the results. And when I'm shifting, my kids are feeling better and new solutions are coming up and these opportunities show up and my relationships are better and on and on you go. And is there a ceiling? No, I haven't found a ceiling. Just like there's no bottom to how bad you can feel. There's no ceiling to how good you can feel. So hopefully it's an ever evolving thing. What are, you, what are the blocks? to uh, manifesting? Are there are things that we are, in, are doing that. Yeah. Good question. I'm going to pull it up. Um, I, I, you know, there's obviously infinite blocks, but I list here in what is it? Chapter 11. Where is it? Um, that I call them limits, right? And I'm just, I categorized them into seven limits, but they don't have to be. It's on page 184 of my book. Um, these are not extensive and they'll overlap, but I think that they're, they get you to thinking about where is my biggest challenge right now? Very common one is upper limits. And if you've heard of upper limits, it's just a ceiling of what we just talked about, how good you can let things be. So this is fear of success and inner limit of how good things can get, self-sabotage, regression. You feel this is very common in women, which I, I would estimate is a huge cause for divorce. Um, they feel like if they keep going, they're going to leave their husband behind mm -hmm. or they will not be able to create a relationship where they are welcome as they are, right? So that's an example of an upper limit, which is there to really break you through to the next level. And your husband will probably come with you if you can allow it. But it is very common that this is like sort of in your idea of what you were told about being a woman and you should be like this and you shouldn't be like that. And so there's an upper limit on how you can allow yourself to be. The lower limit would be fear of failure, stagnation, depression, denial, suppression. So that's like, I'm just going to dig my head in the sand. I'm not even going to try. I'm just going to stay here, which obviously is a huge block because you are not going to feel the pain, but you're also not going to feel the joy or anything else. It's its own special kind of torture, I feel, to be numb. I feel, I find that to be the hardest pain, actually, because it is... Um, unfortunately more accepted in our society because you're sort of okay, I guess you're like sort of showing up. We have so many people medicated, right? This is where you hit a lower limit often. Like you are functioning, but are you living? Yeah. Right. Um, friendship limits, fear of living behind, uh, for others, the savior complex, feeling alone, getting desperate. These are things that will sort of put a cap on what we can do and what we can create. Um, partnership limits, similar to friendship limits, but with a partner. Money limits, right? That's a big one. Fear of lack, obsessive worry about spending, feeling guilt, judgment, shame, remorse, feeling imprisoned and limited. This is so common. The biggest reason that people think they can't do what they want is money. And there's so much empirical evidence that this is not true, but our mind will have a self-fulfilling prophecy. So if you believe it's money, it's gonna have to be money. Yeah. You are that and, powerful. And it's the reason why people stay in really unhealthy, toxic marriages is because their fear of not having enough money. Absolutely. Whereas if they recognized that the experience of lack is a part of the, it's a symptom of a deeper root. It's that they haven't allowed themselves to acknowledge their needs, express them and meet them. And most people are like, well, how am I going to do that? My parents didn't do that. That's where a lot of it came from. Nothing in my environment did. So how do you expect me to do it? That's really like the biggest question that I get because I'm going to get through the other two limits, which get a little bit more existential. Time limits, right? If you have the money or enough, you're like, I don't have the scarcity of time. I don't have enough uh, hours in the day. There's insufficient, whatever. I'm feeling suffocated, feeling depleted. I can't even think about getting out of it because I'm so damn tired, right? And then you have trust limits. And this is more of an existential crisis, really, where you're just like, I don't understand what the purpose of this is. Like, I just lost meaning in life. And this is where you go from skepticism to cynicism. And that's its own type of block. But so the question that I get most often is, how do I create what I haven't seen or experienced? And it seems like an oxymoron, right? Well, like, if, if you're saying that I'm going to be reflecting my experiences, my beliefs, how do I create something I haven't seen or experienced? This is what sets us apart from any other species that I know of, besides maybe alien species, which I have not encountered yet. Um, <laughs> our ability to use our imagination to imagine things that have never been in our lives or never been, period. We have the capacity to create something that is not here. 
And when we go there in our mind, our body reflects it. Our neurons fire, our synapses fire. Your body cannot tell what's real and what's imaginary. If in your dream state, you experience fear and you wake up and you're in fear, that's because your body interpreted it as real. So how you create it is by utilizing the greatest strength. And I really feel like this is the untapped potential of the coming decades is how to utilize imagination. After all, somebody had to imagine flying to the moon, right? It was a crazy idea for millennia. Like, what are you going to flop your arms and take off and go to the moon? Somebody had to not only imagine it, but take consistent action, eventually have science around it and put a ton of money in it until somebody did it. Now it's a fact. What are the things in your mind that are now a pipe dream, a miracle that in retrospect will be a fact? Oh, I love that. So good. So, so good. So let's talk about your, your book for the last few minutes, Manifest That Miracle. Um, it just released recently, right? Yep. Yeah, it's month. recently something and I'm press. very, I'm very proud that it's got over, we crossed a hundred Amazon reviews a few weeks ago, which was like so amazing. I mean, Amazon's not the only place you can buy, you can buy it in all the bookstores and you get it as an audio book, which is very exciting because I narrated it. It was my first time narrating an audio book. So it was a really trippy process, but you can get it in any form that you choose to read. It's really short. If you are watching this on video, you'll see it's actually a small book, which was really hard for me. If I had my choice, I would have had a 500 page book. My publisher was like, no, you need it to be readable. You can write all the other books after, you know, I wanted to put everything into it. But the idea is that you have no excuses not to read. Majority of it is actually practical exercises. It's a lot less theory and, you know, stories than it is just practice, 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 see for yourself. I feel like that's the most powerful result that we can have as we actually see the impact. Awesome. And I'll make sure that those links are in the show notes. So leave us with what's one thing that someone can do right now, today, this minute to start manifesting the miracle in their life. Well, get the book, obviously. (laughs) I think that's an obvious one. I think, you know, given everything that we talked about right now, I would love for you to try this experiment where you write down the top five most amazing moments of your life. And you notice how it makes you feel. You assess how you felt before you did it. And then you do the top five most amazing. Maybe it's the birth of a child or or a wedding or a trip or some sort of accomplishment standing on stage. Notice how it feels. And if you want to go to the next level, imagine the top five future moments that you'd like to experience. And then watch what happens throughout your day. And if you want to try it for a few days in a row, you'll be blown away. You won't, you will be writing me like, oh my God, Lana, this works. I'm like, yes, I know. (laughs) But this is my most exciting breakthroughs are with people who are very savvy, very intelligent. You know, they, they understand that there's something to this, but they're skeptical. I'm like, be skeptical, keep all your skepticism, but just try it and see for yourself. Those are the people that end up really doing things deliberately because they are not just believing it willy-nilly they're practicing and sort of honing in on what works for them and you'll be amazed at how you can actually mold your life you can mold your reality things that you did not think were in your control are actually far more in your sphere of influence just not in the way that we've been taught oh my god i love that so that's especially for someone who has this major plot twist in their life and it was disrupted and it doesn't look the way that they thought. Like this is the opportunity. It's a perfect time. I have a lot of people going through a major life change and divorces as major as it gets going through my program because it's such a brilliant time. It really is the perfect time when you're broken open to do this work and really create the new life that you have the opportunity to create. Awesome. So thank you so much. I'm going to make sure I have all of the, the things in the show notes so everyone can connect with you and find you and be inspired by you because your energy is awesome. Um, I've already ordered the book, so it's on its way. And um, I have a feeling that I'm going to be ordering a few more to give out for clients that I work with. So it's just, it's great. Thank you for sharing all of that with us today. Thank you so much. And if you love this conversation, tag us on Instagram, Facebook, wherever, because I hope that this is just the beginning of a conversation that we keep having. I really feel like this is how we create 
a future generation of women and daughters and that is really based on the uh, idea that we are far more powerful than we realize. So please tag us, let us know your thoughts.